আচ্ছা প্রথমে একটা জিনিস বলি আজকে যে তার সঙ্গে রিলেটেড টপিক আমি বলছি না যে দিস ইজ দা রেফারেন্স কারণ তোমাদের টেক্সট বইতে আমরা আজকে শুরুতে যে পার্টটা ডিসকাস করবো সেটা সেভাবে কভার করা নেই বাট দ্য ইন প্লাস্টিসিটি দ্য ইউজিং অফ ব্লক স্প্রিং মডেল ইজ ভেরি কমন ওকে ইফ ইউ ইফ ইউ behavior okay uh, in let's say <clears throat> some of the advanced books i would i would mention them later uh, but uh, uh, in addition to that if you also search for plasticity in wikipedia um, you will find uh, the um, the use of block string model to elaborate the behavior in plasticity uh, whereas uh, um, uh, that is not present in your text you can look at this third you know uh, mm, uh, publication right here so the one that i'm highlighting can you can you see that one so there you will find uh, mm, can you see this one yes sir mm. so there you will find uh, use of block string model uh, in explaining the behavior so uh, mm, why am i pointing to this uh, is because uh, the behavior of nitinol the hysteresis behavior of super elastic nitinol is uh, more complicated uh, than the basic uh, uh, nature of plasticity the fundamental nature of plasticity the macrosubic behavior uh, so if we can you know uh, explain or elaborate uh, a more advanced behavior uh, or, or, or a more advanced model using uh, Yes. then that is suitable for uh, our you know course as well that's what i'm just trying to make a point of okay so with that uh, so a uh, so will you be able to search this paper and uh, or uh, you know download this one yes sir i hope uh, you can uh, if you cannot then you can ask me i'll uh... okay anyways uh, what uh, <clears throat> i'm trying to do here um, is uh, first of all i'm trying to do here uh, so in uh, in electrical engineering subject you must have heard of circuits okay i'm kind of uh, trying to draw circuits here okay for mechanical engineering so the simplest we can think of is linear elasticity or elasticity okay. and that can be modeled by thinking of spring wall okay now i am uh, assuming it to be a linear spring the spring constant being e which is also the symbol that we use for young modulus okay now let's say i'm applying a force sigma over here okay and that is causing sir dekha jacche na dekha jacche na sorry so now this is causing an elongation in the spring length and that change in length epsilon so this is a spring elongation and this is the force that is being applied okay so if i were to plot these two quantities that is how much force is required to cause any given amount of deflection that curve 
would look like this. Where the slope of the curve constant. And similarly, in elasticity, in linear elasticity or in metal elasticity, which is typically shown by metals within strains of, uh, of the order 10 to the power minus 3, the stress strain curve is essentially a straight line. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now again, that's not the, that's not exactly how the material behaves. Okay, when you actually do an experiment, you would probably see a lot of discrepancies. Okay, if you start with the assumption that you are going to get a smooth line, a straight line, okay, you are actually going to get a set of points. If you were to do an experiment, you are supposed to get more or less as Cook pointed out you know fall on a straight line passing through the origin why origin because you know uh, whatever configuration you had okay before applying any force you think that of having zero strain that's why it, it must go through the origin okay so so that's why this one is called Hook's law so points okay, in experiment but we are not talking about actual material behavior that actual macroscopic behavior we are not talking about experiments we are talking about how we can model that behavior okay so when we essentially say linear elasticity we are looking at the material like this as if the material is a linear spring the irony being the spring itself in reality if there is any such thing as a spring an elastic material and it's actually the materials elastic behavior which is reflected on the springs uh, elasticity okay but again this spring is not the spring that you see let's say a closed coil helical spring that you see in reality okay this spring is simply a model okay and this is our model and we can wish form of behavior that we want and here we choose to give it a behavior where the relationship between its applied force and uh, um, resulting deflection being a straight line the, the relation between these two quantities being a straight line okay to be frank in reality if you are to work with if you are to do an experiment on spring you would probably not be seeing And there are several reasons for that. Okay, not only materials nonlinearity because material is not linear beyond certain point. Forget about material nonlinearity. Let's say you are well within the elastic limit. Then also you need to understand that there is something called geometric nonlinearity. And. Uh, let's say this type of thing when you have plasticity that is called material nonlinearity now what is geometric nonlinearity you see i'll just take the example of a beam cantilever beam okay and if you and if these are the standard parameters of the beam, the length, you know, the, uh, the area moment of inertia in the correct direction and the Young's modulus, okay, then you know the amount of deflection would be this quantity. It's a very familiar expression for you. But then, is 3EI by L cube is the spring constant for the cantilever beam. But you see all this while you are assuming that this beam itself is a slender member and which mostly remains horizontal. 
that means even with a tiny bit of deflection and yes all of this linearity in this such deflections are tiny with tiny bit of deflection the spring still remains linear you see the point that i am trying to make here think of when you are applying a load of p by 2 then you are supposed to get a deflection of delta equals delta delta 1 equals actually delta by 2 that's the that's the amount of deflection that you are supposed to get but by the time the the set of equations that you derived for a straight beam must no longer be applied ei point ta ki bujhe jacche je we had the derivation of this equation with the assumption of a straight beam but uh once i apply a given load and this uh, beam bends you know such uh, such equations are no longer applicable right yes sir. Okay. but we still use them because the basic assumption is that the deflection itself is tiny so much tiny that uh, you never have to take into consideration the bending of the beam or the so called geometric non linearity okay you need to understand that all this while the material is still elastic we use the young's modulus as the material parameter okay but uh, it's the large deflection that can cause a non linearity in the p delta uh, relation so the p delta relation could go like this or could go in the reverse direction okay but the geometric uh, non linearity plays its part in causing such effect okay but coming back to our model this is a model okay here no amount of strain is ever going to give you geometric non linearity that's the very assumption of the model it's it's very uh, idealistic in nature it only has that that much of uh, capability of capturing the reality this is reality and the model only has that much capability to capture the reality as much you enable it okay so if you write this equation doesn't have the capability to capture the effect of geometric non linearity but you see if it is something like e0 epsilon plus e1 epsilon squared and so on okay then probably it will be able to capture the geometric non linearity and chances are this so you could also incorporate the material non linearity so but then again this is just a model the simplest model that we can use to model linear elasticity acha your argument would be why should i bother about any amount of non linearity in elasticity when the very model of elasticity is only valid very hooks law any value of strain and in uh, one of our previous classes we explained although that is only a very tiny value of strain that is not the tiniest value of stress the point being most of our designs are well within the elastic limit because not only have we have to design components for static loading we will have to design them for dynamic loading or fatigue loading or limit on stress is no longer your yield stress it becomes somewhere between the between the endurance limit and the yield stress or even lesser than that okay so <clears throat> so
so uh, so you can when the strain is this tiny okay why should i bother about non linearity you should not and actually we don't and actually don't have to do any improvement okay with metals okay unless of course with small strain there could be large deflection okay there at times we might require to metric moment now you might uh, ask this question what is uh, mm, how can we get a uh, large deflection with small strain yes that is possible with bending that is possible okay. bending stresses are typically much smaller compared to the amount of deflections that you get okay. because you need to understand the deflection is not its axis it is happening by you know pro providing a lateral deflection and it is much simpler to cause a lateral deflection on a slender component if you have a scale with yourself just check how much easier it is to you know bend it as compared to elongate it and then even with metals okay you can uh, you can have so that is number one reason and number two reason is that that sometimes there is material non linearity even within elasticity okay. so there is something called hyper elasticity and hyper elasticity sorry and hyper elasticity falls in the domain of true elasticity unlike viscous elasticity or super elasticity okay hyper elasticity is a true elasticity typically shown by rubber like materials some of the hyperplastic mod hyperplastic models are new hookian muni rivling okay m o n e y muni rivling okay some of the hyperplastic uh, material models so these are models which work with rubbers so this is how the hyperplastic city models look like and that is just in tension when you have compression the behavior is further strange so <clears throat> so if i were to draw a spring for this one that spring would have a very non linear behavior okay so that's the equation of that spring would be very non linear that's that's the point i'm trying to make here since we are on the topic observed in glass like materials and super elasticity as we just saw earlier is shown by nitino and this is uh, my first assignment of the day okay so you can you can go to but you can uh, it would be better if you could find uh, some uh, more concrete source let's say if, uh, a textbook or from lecture notes somewhere over the internet okay uh, 
why this is an assignment because this is this is not covered in our course so that's why i'm asking you to look in the over the internet and uh, for three different which is not really a part of our course okay i need you to make um, a three page three page assignment uh, for you know describing how these models are you need to incorporate a uh, tiny bit of uh, mathematical part of the model as well and discuss uh, and you can also in incorporate the graphs how the material behavior looks like okay. so um, uh, this three okay and uh, actually for su uh, super elasticity you can you know take help of the uh, paper i just showed you So this is your assignment for the day. Uh, I'm going to lag. Okay. 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 what materials uh, you know show uh, such behavior okay so, so uh, regarding this set of material behaviors hyperelasticity viscosity viscoelasticity viscoelasticity and superelasticity i need you to make a three page assignment okay each uh, material behavior so basically i need you to make a short note of each of the material behaviors and uh, and in that short note you are supposed to include uh, the graphs okay of the stress strain curves uh, number 1 number 2 is a little bit of uh, mathematical representation of the model and uh, and the background uh, why such model is required uh, in i mean uh, i just give you an example of rubber like matrix but if there are different types of rubbers okay so so such things you can mention okay uh, and it would be even better if uh, in those short notes you could all also include the microscopic uh, um, uh, behavior of the mod model the mic uh, or the microstructure of the model because of which ei pata shona gelo Yes, sir, microscopic behavior of the model tar pore kete gelo kotha ta so i uh, uh, so if you could focus on the uh, the the nature of the microstructure okay uh, for each of these materials that that would give uh, a uh, in such way okay each of these materials behave in a very different way okay hyperelasticity being uh, a form of true elasticity this is the loading curve and this is the unloading curve is the same curve and for a given value of strain there is only a single value of stress okay uh, again that is the most idealistic situation actual materials might behave a slightly different way ji bojha gelo yes sir okay acha so since we are uh, in the topic of models okay let's uh, complicate our model little bit so this time what i'm doing is i don't have the string i just have a block resting where on a rough surface which can provide some frictional support now there if i were to draw the free body uh, so what i'm doing next is i'm just pulling this one with the force of sigma so if i were to draw the free body diagram of the block okay so there is okay and of course there is certain force in the normal direction which but that is not really important to us okay. so since we are trying to model it uniaxially we are just 
you know uh, it's it's an incorrect representation but we are just doing it doing it uh, for one direction okay on this side let's see the weight of the block itself okay so weight and then there is this normal force acting from uh, coming from the ground itself and both as you can see are cancelling each other okay. but you see there is some frictional resistance to this block coming from the ground and that that if magnitude must be less than this capital f or let's call it sigma y okay so now <clears throat> if i were to draw the load versus deflection curve for this block can you tell me what will happen sir elongation hobe block ta block ta elongation hobe na so this you can think of this to be a rigid block the block can only slide acha how much force is required to cause any amount of slide you see the the purpose of friction okay or the way the friction works is uh friction always tries to counterbalance any force that is trying to cause any relative motion between the surfaces okay so if immediately makes itself equals sigma and uh, so that is in equilibrium and the magnitude must be less than sigma y but the moment sigma is beyond sigma y or reaches sigma y it cannot go beyond but the moment it reaches sigma y if cannot catch up okay uh, so then the block starts moving and that should be the situation okay so how would be the stress strain diagram initial but no motion is happening initially you are applying force no motion is happening until you reach this limit threshold value sigma y and then the block starts moving sir x axis elongation x axis elongation so as long as the force is below certain threshold okay the limit friction the block remains stationary and the moment you you are able to give force now the block starts moving that is what is supposed to happen in friction right this part is quite understandable right this is how it is happening in friction so the elongation ta there is a case the elongation means let's say you are at this point okay and after a while the block has moved to this location okay 
so you can think of the midpoint there so that would be your elongation deflection whatever you want to call it the block actually is not deforming the block is just sliding it's a rigid block so block moves right once sigma equals sigma y block moves can you follow that yes sir eight graph ta oi elastoplastic graph ta modon no we'll talk about how what this graph is called but can you uh, can you uh, act, you know act, Uh, as long as sigma is less than sigma y, the block remains stationary, and as soon as the sigma equals sigma y, the block then starts moving. Sir, uh, need... it's sir, is the static friction that has to be exit exceeded? Yes, that's what it is, right? Okay, so uh, uh, you know, right, how static friction works? The static friction force has no but it has a limiting value friction force simply adjusts itself so as long as sigma is less than sigma y a full sim uh, simply uh, adjusts itself to sigma and keep the block in equilibrium the moment sigma reaches sigma y a full reach, reach its limiting value and actually it cannot provide any further resistance okay and then the block starts moving so just brush up static friction understanding the static friction force is not a fixed force value what is the kinetic friction is and here i am just assuming that your static and kinetic friction forces are the same i mean the limiting static friction and the kinetic friction force are the same the coefficients of friction are the same ebar bujhe jacche ki hocche yes sir you accept this curve the load deflection curve that is how it is supposed to happen do you think do you agree on the nature of the curve yes sir yes sir okay acha so this thing is called rigid plastic so this is rigid perfectly plastic vitreal behavior that means in uh, when the stress is below eel stress if the material was completely rigid not deflecting at all okay it perfectly plastic so this is our model number 1 elasticity this is our model number 2 rigid perfectly plastic material acha what happens now if you reduce the value of sigma so let's say the block has moved this much okay at certain strain value let's call it epsilon star so at epsilon star you simply decided to reduce the uh, the value of sigma So the block uh, gets stationary again. Yes. So the block becomes stationary at that value of epsilon, which means the block simply stops, and now you can reduce sigma as much you want. So you load it using this curve, but your unloading curve is different. As the initial part of your loading curve. and you end up losing this much of energy in moving the block this work that you did on the block in moving certain distance that is dissipated in the form of heat okay so this is the classic example of plasticity Okay. Now, friction and plasticity 
are very similar one is a surface behavior the other one being microstructural behavior but their analogies go hand in hand they basically are the same i mean thermodynamically speaking they are basically same and you can refer to plasticity being internal friction now in uh, in uh, you know uh, in friction the roughness is between two contacting surfaces and in plasticity the friction is between let's say dislocation if the dislocations could freely move okay there i mean sorry 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 yeah the dislocation mo movement itself is plasticity right so so uh, that is in a way similar to your friction okay acha now let's try another one this time what i'm doing is i'm taking the block taking the rough surface and also attaching the spring so property of the surface is sigma y property of the spring is e and now i am applying the force right here if i had to plot the stress strain diagram or the load deflection curve what would happen now this time one is measured from here so we are always talking about the movement of point of application of the force এটা কি বোঝা যাচ্ছে কি হবে এখানে আমার কথা শোনা যাচ্ছে এটা বোঝা যাচ্ছে কি কি হবে এবার প্রথম দিকে একটু লিনিয়ার হবে তারপর নন লিনিয়ার বোঝা যাবে ফার্স্টলি লিনিয়ার হবে খুব সম্ভবত এটা বুঝতে গেলে আমাকে দুটো ফ্রি বডি ডায়াগ্রাম আঁকতে হবে সো ফার্স্ট লেট আস ড্র দা ফ্রি বডি ডায়াগ্রাম অফ দা স্ট্রিং and the free body diagram of the string goes like this sigma and sigma so when you attach two components in series the force simply you know remains the same the same and when there are you know multiple springs see that this thing is you already know when you have multiple springs and you apply certain force at that time for both the springs the deflection is the same but the force gets, gets distributed in parallel correction in series the deflection is distributed so the deflection of the spring is different from the deflection of the block okay so you see as long as you are below okay the block simply the block simply follows this curve the loading and unloading is this curve okay whereas the spring simply deflects following this curve as long as sigma is less than sigma y the block remains stationary and the spring moves so you have a curve like this 
coming only from the block. The slope being the Young's modulus, okay, or the spring constant. Up to this point, the block remains stationary. But then, the moment the force reaches sigma y, the block cannot no longer block cannot any longer remain stationary. The block simply starts moving. Okay, and since the force cannot go even further, therefore there is no elastic strain anymore. can be thought of epsilon e coming from the spring or the elastic string and epsilon p coming from the block so this is how the loading curve works and let's say at certain point you decided to unload again the moment sigma is less than sigma y the block becomes stationary and further what would happen the spring elongation will reduce but the block has become stationary so you cannot recover any strain from the block side that's why this is the plastic strain okay now if i were to plot two other curves where you have sigma epsilon If I were to plot stress versus elastic strain, that would be this curve forward and backwards. If I were to plot the plastic strain, okay, that would be simply the curve that you got from the rigid perfective. So this material we would refer to as elastic perfectly plastic okay again these are all models in reality there is no such thing as elastic perfectly plastic material okay what we have the elastic part of the slope being much higher compared to plastic part but that doesn't mean that in the plastic part the stress doesn't increase much it does increase actually you know it can increase at least the same amount as sigma y okay i have worked with stainless steel materials and the experimental results show that the yield stress may be MPA, but the you know final the, the ultimate stress would be 400 500 or 600 mpa so the stress rises further is just it rises in a much smaller slope okay and if you are working with a very tiny amount of plastic strain let's say 1% of plastic strain let's say okay or even smaller then then the negligible and in that case you can model the material to be elastic perfectly plastic and get good and uh, good enough result for that okay so you might argue what is the importance of rigid perfectly plastic uh, what is the importance of studying rigid perfectly plastic uh, model first of all it gives us the you know building block for more complex models number 2 is stress versus plastic perfectly plastic acha what happens for this entire length of you know so this much is your plastic strain right it's a parallelogram so this entire thing is your plastic strain and this entire length is represented on the elastic uh, stress versus elastic curve by just this point over here a single point okay to you know draw them with time okay so initially you go from the origin to sigma y following this line but for this entire duration the curve remains stationary at this point 
once you go over here and unloading starts then you follow again the elastic part of the curve ei part ta bojha gelo ha sir মানে যে পয়েন্ট অফ টাইমে আমরা আনলোডিং করছি তো টাইমে ডিপেন্ড হচ্ছে ওই লেন্থটা এটা বলতে আছেন না আমি টাইমে ডিপেন্ডেন্সের কথা কিছু বলিনি সো অল আই এম ট্রাইং টু সে হিয়ার ইজ ইউ সি ইফ আই ওয়ান্ট টু अप्लाई দ্য স্ট্রেন এট আ গিভেন রেট ওকে সো ক্রোনোলজিক্যালি এনি স্মল ডিসটেন্স অ্যালং এক্স অ্যাক্সিস আই উইল সি হ্যাপেনিং ওভার দ্য But if I were to plot stress versus elastic strain, okay, for, अच्छा, if I were to plot let's say stress versus plastic strain for this much time, I would not see any change in strain. After that, beyond this point, I would see change in strain. But after this point, again, no further change in strain. In in stress versus elastic strain, same rate of change of strain. as the total strain but then after that the strain becomes stationary strain doesn't change as long as you do not do the unloading and this is all in reference to elastic plastic perfectly plastic material eta to bojha jacche je during this whole period there is no for the elastic strain happening increase because your elastic strain is simply stress divided by young's modulus is it clear now yes sir okay acha now let us make the model even further complicated so this thing would give elastoplasticity with hardening and this parameter h is called the hardening so now let's try to see what happens with the stress strain diagram for that i need three free body diagrams so this is the spring with an young modulus of e this is the elastic spring and on either side of that the position of the spring is simply epsilon e and that is simply sigma by e so it still remains the strain for the block okay so there is f there is sigma and there is another force coming from the plastic spring actually that also imparts some amount of elasticity in plasticity that actually is the reason to have 
elastic strain even beyond the yield stress. So that's what is hardening. So how does that happen? We'll look, look into that in a minute. So we would call this stress the back stress. And, uh, that back stress is very different from residual stress. But this actually plays, you know, uh, an important role in plasticity of the material. Okay. We'd look into that in a minute. And then the, having been subjected to aches and aches on either side, giving you, you see, the deflection of the second spring is same as the movement of the block. Okay. So this thing is plastic strain and that is simply X divided by H. Okay. Actually, of you can think of H to be something like this. The differential part, okay, because H is often nonlinear. I mean, H is simply the slope of the simply the slope of X versus X versus epsilon P. Okay, so you can think of H to be a slope. So, so this is a nonlinear spring whose slope is h. That implies epsilon p is h, the hardening. Okay, so <clears throat> now let's try to draw the stress strain diagram for for elastoplasticity with hardening. Achha, at this point, I should also no. Okay, I'll do that later. And just look how much am I extending the quadrants of the stress strain diagram. So the first part is same up to a point. Only the elastic string is elongating. And up to that point, sorry, up to that point, uh, so at this point rather, when there is, when it reaches yield stress, so on the, on this spring, the force is sigma y. On this, Elastic spring is sigma y. Now, since the block is not moving, x has been 0 until this point. The back stress has been 0 until this point. Now, now the moment, now the moment block starts moving, both Okay, so since this is a rigid block, you can think of this to be a rigid connection. Okay, for the block to move, 
you are subjecting both the spring to the force now okay now therefore becomes et okay which is essentially d sigma d epsilon the total strain but then your d epsilon is your d epsilon elastic and d epsilon plastic you see from this i can say that x is simply sigma minus f and as long as sigma is less than sigma y f is just equal to sigma and x equals 0 okay <clears throat> so that is what we can get from this free body diagram now once sigma goes beyond and this time it actually goes beyond sigma y then f is simply sigma y and x is simply sigma minus sigma y point being d so this quantity is d sigma d epsilon elastic d epsilon plastic and then what i can do is since d sigma is dx i can write d sigma d epsilon p to be h so it is 1 by sorry it is e h plus h which means the tangent modulus is uh, 1 by 1 by e plus 1 by h which is e a by e plus h is less than both Young's modulus and hardening and is actually because h is many times smaller than young's modulus so this part right here is much smaller compared to 1 okay so what is tangent modulus tangent modulus is this part of the curve the slope of anywhere in the plastic part One by et. Okay, et is the slope. If I were to plot stress versus elastic strain, that is still the same. One Young's modulus. Elastic strain. That would be initially this vertical line up to sigma y. But beyond sigma y, this one would be having a slope 1 by h. 
okay because d sigma d epsilon p is h okay but when you combine these two strains you get the total strain and then the slope is the tangent modulus a of d bodha bodha gelo ei part ta ki bodha gelo yes sir bodha gacha to okay okay so um, so let's take a break of 5 minutes and we'll come back after 5 minutes we'll continue it is very important for us to understand the behavior of elasticity with hardening okay so what we are doing today is only the uniaxial behavior of that and later on we'll try to build up our understanding on the multiaxial formulation of the same but before going into the multiaxial formulation we'll devote probably one week only to look at the linear algebra of the uh multiaxial stress state okay and actually uh, the green strain part the cauchy stress part and all the uh cauchy's equation of uh, the relation between traction and stress all of those are going to be important okay uh, because those are basic continuum mechanics and any subject that relates to solid mechanics or continuum mechanics be it theory of plasticity or finite element method everything will be required requiring those fundamental understanding of uh, continuum mechanics okay so for uh, our subject of this semester as well okay so let's meet in another 5 minutes
এই পর্যন্ত আমরা যেটা ডিসকাস কোন জায়গাটা মনে হচ্ছে অন্য কিছু হবে সবকিছু বোঝা যাচ্ছে আচ্ছা বাকি দুজন কিছু বলছো না বাকি দুজন কি বুঝতে পারছো সব কোন অসুবিধা থাকলে বলো unload from can be drawn in a better way let's say this is the curve and let's say you are now trying to unload it okay you already know the answer it is supposed to follow the elastic part of the curve uh but because the moment uh, the stress would reduce by delta sigma okay acha oh, one more point i missed okay at any given value of sigma beyond sigma y the amount of stress that has increased beyond is actually same as x if you recall x is supposed to be sigma minus sigma y okay in the plastic part and that actually is integration h d epsilon p so just keep that in mind okay what is the significance of that if i had to plot x with plastic strain that would be the same curve same slope anywhere just starting from the origin instead of sigma y starting from the origin okay. it's the same curve now if i try to unload from here let's say there is a delta sigma reduction in the stress what would happen that delta sigma okay would cause to the block what would happen to the block first of all as you can see the elastic strain would reduce okay so from this equation you can see the elastic strain would reduce but the moment sigma reduces by delta sigma okay and let's say this is a very tiny reduction okay. an instantaneous reduction at any instant that reduction is happening okay at that instant the reduction is happening so x still remains the same value okay because this spring hasn't gotten a chance to reduce is the stretch the same way it is this quantity still okay then what would happen then immediately again go back to the earlier equation so x equals actually sigma minus f okay and if now so let's say i'm trying to unload from sigma star so this is sigma star call the x value as x star okay so if i have reduced the sigma okay
So F is no longer sigma y. F has reduced. So if this is sigma minus sigma star minus delta sigma, F is also sigma y y minus delta sigma. Okay. So this spring has not gotten the time because you instantaneously, you know. Earlier, you were just increasing the stress. Now you're just trying to reduce. So this is a very tiny delta sigma, but instantaneously it is happening. So the spring hasn't, you know, shrunk. So X star remains the same, but the stress reduces. The immediate effect is the system enters into the domain of static friction. The resistance or the kinetic friction, it is well within the limits of static friction. So this F is less than sigma Y. Okay. And <clears throat> because of that, the block becomes only type of deformation that is happening is happening over the elastic stream and therefore you have your elastic deformation elastic unloading okay. perfectly elastic unloading okay but with hardening i don't want to stop right there so this one is x star let's say now imagine if I go in the reverse direction. Now I'm compressing. If it were a bar, I'm compressing. Now what I'm doing is I'm just, I have just reversed the direction of sigma. So sigma was gradually reduced to zero. And now I'm pushing the spring in the opposite direction. And you know that the same thing would happen. This time, just try to imagine what is the, what has been the free body diagram of the block. So there is this X that is being applied here, X star that is being applied here. And you see, even after at this point, even after the complete removal of the total stress, a non-zero back stress has remained. A back stress is like a driving force. So that driving force is still remained even after the complete removal of do you have a plastic string? Okay a shift from the original position of the block, but also there is an internal stress that is there, okay, a back stress that is there. Now, now imagine you were applying a sigma, which is now a negative quantity. Sigma now is a negative quantity. Okay, uh, thinking this way, it is now acting in the opposite direction. This is the origin. Uh, sorry, what happens on the x axis? That means when you have reduced the stress to zero, okay, at this point, there is no stress. Okay, but the block is still in equilibrium. Okay, and if the block is in equilibrium, then the friction is no longer acting from right to left. It is actually acting from left to right. So, so as you reduce the stress, the friction value also reduces, just we discussed. So it initially it reduces from sigma y to sigma y minus delta sigma, but then it keeps on reducing. And after certain uh, point, the direction of the friction force changes. It becomes zero, and then the direction of the friction force changes. Okay. And now the friction force is acting in the opposite direction. When you come to the x-axis, the friction force is acting in the 
opposite direction. Now, if we apply a minus sigma in the reverse direction, that means in the compressive side, if we are now in the fourth quadrant, then F keeps on increasing. And F is sigma plus X star. Okay. And, and that must be less than sigma Y. And now the yielding in compression happens yielding in compression happens moving in from right to left when the sigma value minus sigma is actually point is you see you had an elastic deformation then had elastoplastic deformation and you had some back stress developed some hardening being done and it can be shown that if you again try to you know if you unload it to zero and then if you try to reload stress value you only yield you only yield at this higher stress value First, try to see that. You see, the moment you reduce the stress, the block becomes stationary. And as you go downward, the block still remains stationary. Okay. And the block only starts moving once we apply a stress value higher than this one. So the sigma star now has become your new yield stress. Okay. For the hardened material. If you're looking at a uh, bar, okay, which its yield stress in tension has also increased from sigma y to sigma star and it has increased by this hardening amount the hardening stress actually this type of hardening is called kinematic hardening what is meant by kinematic hardening i'll explain that in a minute so this hardening amount actually adds up this hardening amount actually adds up to the yield stress value in the tension that has to be with sigma star. You can no longer yield from sigma y. Okay. But what has happened to yield stress in compression? It has actually reduced by the amount of back stress. The point being that the range of elastic domain is still twice sigma y. Okay bottom line is if you had plastic deformation in tension or hardening in tension where you have increased your yield stress by hardening in tension you'd have your yield stress in compression simultaneously being reduced and this is known as Boschinger effect I may not be correct with the spelling. Okay. So this thing is known as Boschinger effect. Okay. And this Boschinger effect is uh, very evident in all real life materials, ductile materials. Okay. I mean, that is how actually materials behave. The Boschinger effect is actually an experimental observation. And with this model, you are able to you know, represent the Boschinger effect or mimic the Boschinger effect. 
okay and that's why the back stress plays an important role to be frank sigma minus x is referred to as the effective stress and the entire calculation is based on the effective stress or and whether or not this effective stress reaches the yield value or not now since these are signed quantity also the value of you know if sigma and x have the same sign on the opposite matters if they have the same sign then the sigma effective okay then you know sigma actually so the yielding happens at a stress higher than sigma y for example if you look at this that x and the you know sigma have the same sign so in tension um the yielding happens at a higher stress but in compression since they they have opposite sign yielding happens so absolute value of this quantity must be less than or equal to sigma y and that is how the kinematic hardening works that means if there is hardening in one direction in the opposite direction in the reverse direction softening is happening okay now ei part ta ki ekhon obdi bojha gelo ja bollam shobai bujhte pachho ha sir जिनिंगलोटेंसो okay because there is plastic strain so i do not know there is any other type of hardening okay number 1 number 2 when we typically refer to strain hardening work hardening etc there we are referring to that an experiment is going on a forging operation is going on i don't know okay so don't bring any of them over here okay in this case it's a model okay where it is shown that as the block moves or you know in a macroscopic material sense so this is a lump model or a circuit model okay in a circuit model if the block moves that means in uh, macroscopic uh, material behavior some plastic deformation is happening and that plastic deformation results into certain amount of back stress or hardening stress okay and that hardening stress changes the yield stress in a given direction and then it can also be seen seen that in the opposite direction the yield stress is actually reducing okay it's a model and uh, don't expect anything else from what it is supposed to do it is supposed to represent or mimic the real life behavior through equations through a set of simple equations okay um हार्डन इफ आई वेट टू plot the stress strain diagram stress versus total strain that would look something like this first the elastic part then beyond yield stress you have your <clears throat> plastic part okay and of course some elastic strain is also happening because the stress is increasing let's say you start unloading from here but because your yield stress has now changed to the last highest value to the highest value highest stress value that you have reached so that there is your new yield stress and that is through happened through hardening and that same amount is being subtracted over here when you are yielding in the opposite direction
typically with non-linear hardening, if it were linear hardening, this is exactly what is supposed to happen. That means after complete completion of the hysteresis cycle, it should come back to the original curve, okay, original loading curve. Uh, but with non-linear hardening, okay, typically it doesn't come back to the same line. But you know, with several cycles of loading, 5, 10, 12, 20, 15, 100 cycles of loading, it actually eventually converges to a single curve. It is, it initially is like a uh, spiral, okay. increasing, decreasing, a lot of things happening. Eventually, it just, you know, uh, converges to a single curve. Now this is stress versus uh, uh, total strain. What would happen if I were to plot stress versus elastic strain? Can you tell me what would happen with stress versus elastic strain? It's always the same line. Moving up or moving down. If stress is reducing, moving down. If stress is stationary, stress is not changing, like elastic, perfectly plastic, then also the strain is stationary. Okay. In, in a single word, stress is proportional to strain. Okay. Or, you know, you are obeying the Hooke's law. Again, all of these are models. And this is what is happening with the plastic strain. So here, you just have to subtract the elastic part. You just have to subtract the elastic part of the slope. Okay. Just make these lines flat. So you have curves like this. What happens to the back stress? Back stress only changes with the plastic string. So let's say back stress reached over here. And since plastic strain is not changing, it doesn't follow this vertical line. So again, when the plastic strain changes, it will have some sort of change like this and like this. Okay, that's it. Um, one more model to consider where you have viscoplasticity. So whatever plasticity that we considered so far is rate independent. That means the stress didn't, didn't depend on the strain rate. If the strain stress is supposed to depend on strain rate, that would be called viscoplasticity. You might recall how uh, viscosity is defined. Okay, tau is uh, mu times uh, gamma dot, right? So the stress is proportional to strain rate. Okay, I mean, that is just Newtonian fluid. Okay, but if you could think of a generalized expression where uh, mm, uh, your viscopartic, viscoplastic part of the stress that is one part of the stress. It's not a total stress. Just like back stress, back stress is one of the parts. So the total stress sigma is uh, your yield stress plus back stress plus 
your viscoplastic stress. So the viscoplastic part of the stress is your So this one is called drag force and this end can be called viscoplastic uh, index or something. Okay. So think of uh, this spring and then there is this nonlinear damper right here. Okay. Both connected to this block. Okay, uh, and this one as it has a hardening of H, you can think of this one has properties like K and N. Okay, and then there is your elastic spring. So basically, what happens is this time the only difference is in the stress strain diagram. You see. Um, Hello. What So the thing is, this time the stress is also dependent on the strain rate. Okay, with, with viscoplasticity. And simply the stress increases if you increase the strain rate. Okay. Higher the strain rate, higher is the stress. So all of the above properties rate dependence. Okay. So the strain rate dependence is classified as viscoplasticity. Okay. So that is all I had to cover today. Uh, so in the next class, we'll continue with the multi-axial formulation. Any other queries regarding today's class? Sir, a graph that you could have said that I'm going to know. A graph that history is this loop. Give up a same with the uh, earlier set of curves. The only difference is uh, with with the change in strain. So it's a nonlinear damper, and it uh, the stress across this damper is sigma v. So this damper uh, has a sigma v and sigma v around it. Point being, uh, this is a free body diagram of the first spring, sigma over here and sigma over here. And this spring has a uh, mm, x and x on either side. So sigma equals, and uh, mm, as you can see, uh, so from, uh, from this block, you know that it is being subjected to uh, 
sigma y over here if the plastic deformation is happening sigma y over here sigma over here then there is a sigma v over here and there is a uh, your x over here so basically sigma equals sigma y plus sigma v plus x in the plastic deformation okay so if you draw draw uh, the hysteresis loops uh, on your own you see there is uh, not much of a difference that is going to be is just that uh, this uh, this curve right here you can take the total stress strain diagram this curve right here they are going to be different set of lines over here or over here and only increasing with the direction of the uh, with the magnitude of the strain rate value of the magnitude okay so that is the only change that is going to be there rest is same is it okay okay sir yes sir okay so we'll meet on meet on next and uh, what you can do is you can uh, brush up whatever uh, continuum mechanics we had studied uh, in the Mm. Uh, in the uh, find element method, uh, and you will find all those uh, videos also in the YouTube. Okay. 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 So let's uh, meet on the next class.